On behalf of Georgetown University, Qatar, and GUQ Center for International and Regional Studies, I welcome you all to tonight's event, Has the FIFA World Cup 2022 Changed Qatar? My name is Professor Daniel Reiche, and I lead the CS Research Initiative called Building a Legacy FIFA World Cup 2022. Today's event is the seventh in our World Cup 2022 lecture series. This is our second time hosting a panel discussion rather than an individual speaker. I believe no other World Cup host had to overcome so many challenges as Qatar, be it first the unquestionable need for domestic reforms, particularly regarding the living and working conditions of the migrant workers who constitute the majority of the population in the country. Second, the regional tensions in 2014 with some countries withdrawing their ambassadors from Doha. Third, the blockade, of course, that lasted from June 2017 until January 2021. And finally, Qatar had the responsibility to pursue the World Cup preparation during an unprecedented global pandemic. We still don't know how it will affect the event. However, recent developments look promising and it might become a relatively normal World Cup unless the Russian-Ukraine war escalates into a larger global conflict, something that hopefully will not happen. Some of the changes that have taken place in Qatar since December 2010, which is when the country was awarded the 2022 World Cup, are remarkable. And particularly so when Qatar's policies are compared on a regional level rather than with developed democratic states something that certain Western media outlets often do. For some developments, historians might one day dispute about which event changed Qatar more, the blockade by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt, or the World Cup and the accompanying global spotlight in the lead up to the event. While some domestic changes can be attributed to the blockade, other developments happen in the context of the World Cup preparation. Nevertheless, some changes are shaped by both events. In today's panel discussion, we will talk about changes that have taken place in Qatar in the last decade and the challenges that remain. We particularly look at migrant workers and women's rights, societal changes in general, and how staging the world's most remarkable sporting event might not only contribute to diversifying Qatar's natural gas dependent economy, but also impact its relation with other countries in the region and worldwide. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our guests. We will start with a five minute contribution from each guest. And after the five introductory remarks, we will open the floor to Q&A. Please use our hashtag CS2022 if you wish to tweet about this event. Also check out our website for the previous six lectures our blog, which has 27 short articles, and our podcast series of 18 conversations with experts on the 2022 World Cup. You can subscribe to our podcast, Qatar FIFA World Cup 2022, on all common podcast platforms. Today's panel represents five different nationalities. We have experts from Belgium, Germany, Cyprus, United Kingdom, and Qatar. What all of them have in common is that they live and work in Doha and can offer an insider view of the country and the Middle East at large, as opposed to the more dominant, complete outsider perspective when discussing the FIFA World Cup 2022. My first question goes to Professor Nonneman. Gerd, as a professor of international relations and Gulf studies, as well as resident of Qatar since 2011, right after the World Cup was awarded to Qatar in December 2010. I would like to ask you, how has the awarding of the World Cup impacted Qatar's foreign relations and national security? Thank you for that. Um, the first thing I'll say is that while I have indeed lived here now for 11 years, I've been coming in to and visiting Qatar for over 25 years. So I can give a bit more of a longer term uh, impression. And I've been, of course, following Qatar events since even before that. Um, the first sort of contextual thing to say, I think, is that, yes, the, the pursuit of security is 
of particular types of security is, is uh, something of long standing for Qatar. Qatar, of course, is small. It has a relatively small population and it was the, le the latest, um, the least developed and the latest developer of all of the Gulf countries. So it was very, it was small, it was little known and it was very vulnerable in lots of different ways. So when we think about the impact of the World Cup, it's important to note that, as you already suggested, it's not just the World Cup that's affecting, that's impacting, that's changing Qatar. It's just, the World Cup itself, um, when it was awarded, that was part, one component of a much bigger, longer term strategy. And it was a strategy of visibility, making Qatar known and visible, because that brings greater security. If people don't know you exist, they might not blink an eyelid if you're overrun by a major neighbor, for instance. Um, but more, more, important, more importantly, it was about security by developing networks globally and by developing an economy domestically that was going to be sustainable. The, and the two things are partly related because the, dom the domestic security, the economic security was anchored initially in the development of LNG, the LNG industry, which was a major bet. It cost untold billions of investment, which Qatar at the time didn't have, but the bet paid off. So the first stage of building that economic security was based on LNG and the revenues that came from that were then plowed into infrastructure. But at the same time, the LNG and the economic base that was laid was also part of the international security strategy because it was done by building long-term global networks across the globe and by building uh, relationships, long-term relationships um, of, of, as a reliable economic partner that also again brought Qatar a lot of goodwill potentially to draw on in, in crisis situations. Back to the, the, to the domestic um, uh, e economic security and development of a sustainable economy, the second phase that was hoped for was something beyond oil and gas, beyond LNG, or at least complementary to it. So when we're looking at the World Cup, the decision to bid for the World Cup was one of a number of decisions that went that aimed at all these, uh, these, uh, these ambitions, all these goals, right? So of international networks, visibility and international security and domestic uh, development of a, of a sustainable economy. What the World Cup did in that sense, and we'll talk about, I'm sure Professor Antoniatis is gonna talk about the economic impact, but it, it's seen not just as a bauble, as something to look good, something for reputation. It is really, con it was conceived as part and parcel of a bigger strategy um, to, to build a post uh, oil or a complementary to oil and gas uh, sustainable economy. So when we are assessing the impact or the likely impact of the World Cup beyond just today and beyond the stadia that we see around the place, um, and beyond the visibility that Qatar gets at the moment, I think that's important to keep in mind. It was not a momentary decision. It was not something they took for because it looked good. Um, although that, of course, helps. There was hope that it would make Qatar good, uh, look good. It's much more fundamental, both in terms of the long-term vision of what a, an, an economy, a sustainable economy long-term could look like, including major events, and in terms of uh, Qatar's visibility and global connectivity. So the awarding of the World Cup was one element in, in terms of its broader security, economic and international. Um, and the visibility, of course, is part of that. I mean, if you are, as I said, visible, you might get a better reputation. You might draw people to come visit. Lots of football teams are coming. Qatar is already uh, an absolute magnet for sports medicine, for instance, it, it, at an international level. And all of that helps. However, of course, there is also a potential counter element, as we've seen. Um, it's all very well building soft power by using these sorts of things, but you can also have what's called soft disempowerment if the message isn't received well, or if the message is cut across by other messages and other information and disinformation perhaps about migrant workers' uh, circumstances, that then makes the audiences that you're aiming at less receptive to that message. So this is a still a, a work in progress, but overall, the overall strategy of which the World Cup um, application was one part has succeeded in making Qatar both very much more visible, very much better networked globally, and with a better support ne network across the globe. Perfect. Thank you very much, Gerd. My second question goes to Dean Almaiki. Amal, 
uh, representation of Arab women in the media, gender politics, and women's rights are some of your primary research interests. Qatar is portrayed in the Western media as a country that lacks women's rights, or as all Qatari women, such as you as Dean at Hamid Khalifa University, hold important and influential positions. Did the awarding of the World Cup empower women in Qatar, and what challenges remain? I'm happy to be among friends here today. Well, I, I need to embed it within the bigger picture of human rights, and there are many factors at play here. Qatar is a part of an international community and abide by its treaties and agreements. Even before uh, World Cup, and uh, Qatar has also played a major role um, during uh, the rule of uh, uh, His Highness, uh, the Father Emir, uh, especially diplomatic role, and had a penetrating soft power um, via Al Jazeera news, of course. Uh, FIFA, however, has its biggest impact and still does as it's only, uh, it, it doesn't only situate uh, Qatar within the new dynamics vis-a-vis -vis the world, um, but also uh, the rest, um, but also proved to be an, an enabler factor to Qatar's progress and development. Uh, so it expedited, of course, the modernization. Uh, uh, we see it in the infrastructure and the systems, so one of which is the legal system, and more its multicultural um, positioning as a melting pot. And you know, we know that 90% of the population in Qatar are non Qataris and from different parts of the world. Now, the international discourse on human rights or of human rights um, have been mirrored uh, uh, with, an with an internal one on identity, intercultural, and interreligious um, dialogue, all of which are um, manifestations of Qatar's outward agenda. Now, the challenge, however, is as it stands right now, is um, that these narratives, um, how compatible are those narratives to um, you know, the human rights, of course, including women's rights, to uh, traditions and social norms? But I would like to stand here and, and uh, try to point a, a, a major um, issue using FIFA to impose on Qatar uh, to abide by international treaties within a um, uh, within a you know a statement. I don't. It's a statement that I don't agree on. I think the ground was set uh, of such conversations to be held uh, with decades of international uh, education. Qatar Foundation is is a big example of that which produced interlocutors who made these conversations possible in Qatar. And not to be to forget the government's, um, the government's willingness to engage, and not only engage, but also to work on rectifying the laws and, and the procedures and implementing new approved systems to ensure um, the abidance of, of these treaties, especially on human rights. My issue is with this politicization of, of these matters and using them as a part of a propaganda against Qatar um, by nations or entities or even news agencies whose um, own record of human rights uh, uh, is questionable. Second, again, embedded within this context, the, the women's right context is just a part of that. Uh, we see um, how um, the attack on, on Qatar uh, and its um, lack of women's rights um, um, it takes a very reductionist uh, colonial uh, attitude. Um, it reminds us basically that, you know, things don't change really when it comes to uh, how women and Arab women or Muslim women are perceived in the West. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we are against those treaties on the country. I think that there is a grounding and there is a robust uh, conversation um, happening in Qatar about women's rights. Yes, there are loopholes. Definitely, there are laws to be changed, and definitely, the applications of some of the laws are not happening. But this is happening already, whether it's on the academic frontier or even in, in social media, uh, and and you see it uh, by um, um, the recognition of some voices, uh, mainly women voices, really taking uh, center stage. Um, so, and then I think I've reached my point, but I think we need to embed the whole conversation into a one that is that takes into consideration the interrelated um, uh, events and actions that led to those conversations to happen in Qatar. It's not a matter of FIFA or not. Yes, it expedited the conversation, just it's happening right now with women's rights, but I don't think it stops there. Thank you very much, Amal.
my third question goes to Professor Antoniadis. Uh, Alexis, uh, in our latest CS 2022 blog, you argued that hosting the first World Cup in the Middle East has put Qatar on the world map and will help diversify its economy away from the hydrocarbon sector. In your capacity as chair of international economics at Georgetown University in Katya, could you elaborate on this, please? Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for the invitation to be here. So let me give you my, my thoughts on the economic aspect of it. Um, and let, let us start with what is the main objective for the state of Qatar in terms of the economy, and that is diversification. And when we talk about diversification, we talk about getting a bigger share of the GDP from non-hydrocarbon non sector. Of course, this is not the only objective. We have a national vision 2030 that talks about the other pillars such as environmental and social and so on. But we talk about diversification and to understand the impact of the World Cup, what do we mean by diversification? We talk about preserving and managing the wealth for future generations. It's not because we think we will run out of LNG in two years. And the second is to create jobs, many jobs in the private sector for a relative young population. And the only way you can preserve wealth and create jobs is to diversify the economy. And that is not very easy to do. I think the Gulf countries have been trying and failing, if I can misuse the word, just because it's not easy. So you want to diversify the economy. So where does the World Cup fit into that? I think we need to put that in context. If I Allow me to share a, a couple of slides. I think it will make the discussion later. This is what the state of Qatar looked like a few decades ago, not that many, with nothing on the ground. So if I want to make sense um, as an economist of, of Qatar's growth, and I've been here for 10 years, I can think of a very simple model where in the first period we have no money and we have nothing. But we discover there is wealth underground. So as Professor Noneman said, well, there is no choice. You borrow, you borrow heavily, because you have a vision, despite everybody telling you, don't do it. And this is the story of Qatar. Everybody's telling them, don't do it, but somehow they do it and they prove everybody wrong. You borrow, you build Raslafan, you extract oil and gas, you monetize on it, and that you're done. And now you have money in your pocket. So that's the first stage. Now in the second stage, you start with nothing on the ground. That's a picture on the left with a lot of money in your pocket, no schools, no healthcare. So what you need to do is spend the money to build the city. And it's very important to understand that. So this is a picture on the right. We've built everything. So the ne next step is you still have money, you build everything, is to go out and get businesses. And let me stop sharing there. So we are at this transition of going from the second stage to the third stage, which is to go out and get businesses to help us diversify the economy, to get tourists. And to do that, it helps if people know your country. It, does, it, it, it becomes very expensive to get tourists if they don't know your country. It becomes very hard to get businesses if people don't know your country. Uh, we have the tragic developments in Ukraine. A lot of companies from Eastern Europe are now moving to the Gulf. They know Dubai, but now they start to learn Qatar. So, when I think about the World Cup, we can think about diversification in the sense that we can have a business around sports and higher sports economies and have lectures on sports and talk about mega events and management as another industry, but this is not the main thing. I think the main thing the country needs is branding. It's getting attention, like you build a house and then you invite everybody to see the house, to show them what a, what a nice country it is. It's pro-business, it's very safe, it's a place where you, you respect the other, whether it's female, male, you know, uh, Muslim, Christian, and so on. As some of the audience may not know, I'm sitting at Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit university based here in the country. So it, for me, it's really about branding. And, 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 and this is why branding is so important for the state of Qatar, because they're transitioning from the second stage, which is you have the infrastructure, to the third stage, which is let's go and and get businesses to come and build our economy. And the best way to do that is get attention on your country. And it turns out that events related to sports, unfortunately get more attention than events related to geopolitical changes and other news. So let me show my last graph. I don't want to abuse my time. So I do a lot of work on big data. So in, in 2013, I was among the first people to get access to all the tweets since the beginning of Twitter. 
And with a student of mine, we did a very simple exercise. We counted how many times in each day globally, we, we had access to all the tweets, this doesn't happen now. How many times in each day people use hashtag Qatar in English or in Arabic? And we just counted the total number, the sum in each period. And what you see in the blue line, nobody talked about Qatar. And on December 2nd, 2010, the day that Qatar won the rights to host the World Cup in 2022, two, 12 years later, there was a spike in internet activity. Now that does not come as a surprise. Of course, everybody's Googling to figure out that Qatar won the, the, the World Cup. People writing on Twitter, is there such a country we didn't know about? But what is more interesting to me, and I think for our discussion is that, see what happened after. We have what, what we call a structural change. It really put Qatar on the map. And we checked a few other of those spikes. We checked events like uh, the war in, in Libya and so on. And nothing gets more attention than sports. And the biggest sport is the World Cup. It's one of the three mega events after the Olympics and before the, you know, the World Expo. So to me, the, the World Cup, yes, we can, we should try to benefit from the event and have you know, a low hanging fruit, which is to have activities related to mega event management and to consulting related, related to sports and so on. But it's really about branding. But it's not, I, won't, I will end with this thing. It's not really about just Qatar. It's really about getting attention to the Middle East, changing some of the stereotypes we have about the Middle East and at the same time, bringing a lot of scrutiny to themselves because all the, all the eyes are looking at Qatar and how they treat the workers and women and so on. And that pushes them, I think, to undertake more changes than they would have taken without everybody scrutinizing them. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexis. My next question goes to Dr. Al Noemi. Hiya, one of your journal articles is titled The State of Sexuality, Formation and Regulation of Sexual Norms in the Persian Gulf. In your capacity as a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University and a Qatari citizen yourself, I wanted to ask you, how much do you think Qatar society has changed over the last decade? Thank you so much for having me. Um, the short answer to your question is it's changed a lot, but in many ways, it also hasn't changed um, enough, I would say. Um, you know, if I could just pick up on what Professor Antoniadis uh, was saying, uh, how FIFA kind of put Qatar on the map, something that uh, Professor Nonman also mentioned, um, this idea of global visibility. And it just gave me this idea of how global visibility sometimes can come at the expense of invisibility of inner dynamics that are happening within a country. So when I wrote my article about seven years ago, um, a lot of the discussion was around uh, youth issues that uh, Gulf populations face um, regarding sexual norms, re regarding safeguarding children, um, regarding things uh, that are usually left to the jurisdiction of the family and not really a state. Um, and this place, this middle, middle ground of tension where the state doesn't really want to involve itself so much into familial issues, um, but at the same time, uh, families and family units kind of looking towards the state for answers on how we should manage our social dynamics. And when I was thinking about FIFA, you know, one thing that kind of came to mind is uh, Homi Baba's uh, notion of this hybrid third space, right, where it's the construction of a cultural, uh, of a new culture, of a new identity in the face of uh, colonial antagonism and inequity. And in a way, um, this, this idea that, you know, uh, Qatar really gained its visibility through uh, sports and through sports diplomacy is, is very much true. However, I think that, you know, Qatar uh, has been slowly growing and slowly progressing in a way that many states have, have undergone in the international arena. The, the thing is, we start to see some positives coming out of these international sporting events. And we start to see, you know, how it can benefit infrastructure in, in really fantastic ways. Uh, some of it is, uh, you know, we see it in labor issues. You know, we've made great strides in terms of um, labor issues, labor reforms, you know, 
ending the kafala system in 2019. Uh, but at the same time, um, there's also been a slower progression when it's come to, to issues of women's rights, when it comes to issues of children and child protection, when it comes to issues of, you know, how do we deal with uh, certain social norms and the lack of legislation, you know, that protects a lot of vulnerable populations uh, within the society. And I'm not uh, for really kind of, um, how should I say this? I'm not really uh, very pro this idea that, you know, sporting events should be uh, the stimulant that, uh, you know, pushes us forward to, to making uh, good decisions about our social norms or our cultural norms. I think this holds a lot of echoes of a colonial past, like, uh, you know, Professor Dr. Amel was saying. Um, however, I think that we should take these things, you know, in our stride and we should kind of uh, really look at a long lasting effects that we can leave behind, um, one of which is legislation. I mean, uh, the development that we've made through labor reforms is a really good indicator of that. I think that we could uh, do a lot when it comes to women's issues, but we should do it in relation to how we see our societies progressing. Um, thank you for that. Perfect, thank you very much, Haya. Before opening the Q&A, my last question goes to Mr. Tumion. Max. No other topic has received so much international attention since 2010 as migrant worker rights. As head of the International Labor Project Office for the State of Qatar, could you please share with us what brought the ILO to Qatar and how is the ILO's assessment of Qatar's labor market reforms? Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. So what uh, brought the ILO to Qatar? Um, well, the role of the ILO globally is to set international labor standards and to support countries in implementing them. In 2014, the international trade unions brought a complaint to the ILO, uh, alleging that the state of Qatar was not fulfilling its obligations with regards to two conventions that it had ratified, the Convention on Forced Labor and the Convention on Labor Inspection. Uh, after years of negotiations, finally in 2017, a program of work was negotiated by the state of Qatar, uh, by the ILO and social partners. And this program of work uh, is the basis for the labor reform agenda in the country. And it also uh, led to the establishment of the ILO office here nearly four years ago. Now, uh, what we can say is since that time, uh, in that four or five year period, we've seen really tremendous uh, change. Uh, a whole suite of labor legislations uh, introduced, uh, institutions very much built to support the implementation and enforcement of this legislation, but for sure there is still uh, ways to go, there's still work to be done. I think I want to highlight really three key developments, three major uh, milestones, and also, you know, three priorities uh, for the year. And it's a bit, you know, due to time constraints, we'll have to be quite limited, but I do want to underscore the, the breadth, really the, the, how comprehensive these labor reforms are. There's not enough to, to fit into a, a short uh, intervention like this. But, but key highlights, uh, certainly, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, relate to the dismantling of the kafala system, which has led to uh, labor mobility that previously didn't exist in the country. In the one year since the, the, the reforms were introduced in October 2020, uh, 240,000 workers have changed jobs, which is a phenomenal uh, amount of, uh, of workers uh, and labor mobility that, you know, in, in the previous year, for example, for, for comparison, there were less than 17,000 workers who changed jobs and the year before that less than 9,000. So that's fundamentally changing the power dynamics between workers and employers and really incentivizing employers to uh, provide better working and living conditions, better wages in order to uh, attract and, and retain uh, a workforce. The other um, major development I want to highlight is relates to uh, minimum wage and the establishment of a non-discriminatory minimum wage. Um, in March of last year, this came into force and it has benefited 280,000 workers. We've seen 280,000 workers seeing their basic wage increase to the minimum wage threshold of 1,000 rials per month. In addition to the 1,000 rials basic, employers are required to, to cover the cost of 
uh, workers accommodation and food, uh, which can be provided directly or through an allowance of, of uh, 800 reals total. And very importantly, the law establishes a minimum wage commission, meaning that uh, there is a body that will review on an annual basis the impact of the minimum wage and propose uh, adjustments. Um, the third key highlight of the reforms that I want to, uh, to, to mention is the, the social dialogue, dialogue between governments, workers, and employers. Now, this is happening at the, the higher level, the strategic level between the government and between the international trade union movement and the international organization of employers, but also now at the enterprise level in Qatar. For the first time in the region, we have elected migrant worker representatives in enterprises. And this is something that began just with some initial cautious baby steps, but now something that the government is fully recognizing the benefits of. You know, these joint committees uh, at enterprise level where elected migrant worker reps sit with uh, management representatives to discuss and resolve issues in the workplace are seen as a mutual win uh, for workers, employees, and for the government because it helps to prevent issues from, from escalating. So the, these are three new benchmarks, I think, for the region when it comes to labor reform. But I think we also have to focus on some of the, the outstanding uh, issues and some of the challenges that still exist and the priorities that we have, at least uh, in the short term, uh, acknowledging that some of the institution building, building the capacity of the labor inspectorate or the labor course, these are things that will definitely take time. But in 2022, three of the things that we have prioritized are the full implementation of the Kapala reforms. We still see too many instances where employers are retaliating against workers who wish to change jobs. Two is the timely payment of workers' wages. While we see very good compliance with the minimum wage legislation, there are still too many workers who are not paid their due wages on time. They can go months uh, without receiving their due wages. We should acknowledge that there is a much better complaints mechanism in place. There are labor courts in place now. There's a workers fund in place now, but the time it takes from when a worker lodges a complaint until he receives his wages uh, can be several months still. And thirdly, um, the protection of domestic workers' rights. Uh, again, this is an area where there is new legislation in place from 2017. Um, uh, a standard contract for domestic workers was introduced uh, last year, but still not enough domestic workers are receiving their rights under this legislation particularly when it comes to working time and their right uh, to a day off uh, per week. Um, let me end by saying, uh, I, I think echoing what I think all of the other speakers have said, saying uh, in that the World Cup has certainly accelerated the reforms, but uh, as Chaya put it very well, this, it's, this is also clouding, uh, clouding the inner dynamics that are happening within the country. Uh, this is, uh, these reforms are very much in line with the national vision. Um, and uh, as uh, Alexis was saying, you know, we're in the phase now where Qatar is trying to attract investment and to attract in investment, you have to attract talent. And Qatar is in a competition with all countries around the world to attract talent. And you're only gonna be able to do that if you have uh, attractive labor legislations and can uh, apply and enforce uh, these laws and, and have a, a labor market that is attractive. So I think I'll end my intervention there. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Max, and thank you to all speakers uh, to uh, keep the time limit. So we have plenty of time left for discussion now, and we will open the Q&A now. In order to ask a question, please utilize the Q&A feature. I will read the audience's questions and direct them to the relevant panelists. And the first question goes to uh, Max. Uh, from my uh, colleague, Professor Ian Almond, and he's asking, um, or he's writing, a number of people have been quite critical on the ILO, suggesting it is too friendly with the Qatari authorities. Um, do you feel this is the case? And what are your thoughts on the riots uh, that took place in Labour City in late January, where the laborers eventually paid? Um, thanks for the question. I mean, we are conscious of this uh, criticism uh, that exists, but just to reiterate, I mean, our role is to support governments in the adoption of legislation and in the implementation of this legislation. And we have a constructive uh, relationship with the Ministry of Labor. 
that doesn't prevent us from being critical. We've published a number of reports on different subject areas where we highlight the gaps that exist, whether it's in law or practice. We've, we've published reports on uh, assessing the labor inspection system, the wage protection system, looking at occupational injuries and deaths. Uh, in all of these, we have highlight the limitations uh, in terms of what currently exists um, in law and practice and put forward constructive recommendations on how these gaps can be addressed. That's the role that we're playing. Um, we feel we can also provide a more nuanced uh, and, and, and uh, context to the reforms. Uh, as you've heard me say in this intervention already, we recognize the progress, but we know that there's still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, also, in addition to the work of this uh, ILO project office in Qatar, we also have at the global level, the ILO's committee of experts that looks at the application of conventions and recommendations. And they continue to, uh, to publish, uh, this independent body continues to publish its assessment of where Qatar uh, is in terms of application of the standards on forced labor and labor inspection. And those are, are publicly available. So uh, we're aware of the criticism. We think it's uh, a little bit, uh, perhaps not fully understanding of uh, what the ILO's role is. Um, and, and we feel that we do have the space to be both uh, critical and constructive. When it comes to the protests, uh, I mean, we, don't, we don't speak on specific uh, cases. Uh, what we can say is for sure, we've, we've noticed uh, numerous protests uh, covering workers in, in different sectors. Uh, we are uh, conscious that there have been initiatives to uh, improve workers' access to uh, complaints mechanisms. For example, the online complaints mechanism that was adopted uh, last year has seen the number of complaints more than double from the year previous. So in, in 2020, there were uh, 11,000 complaints uh, to the Labour Ministry, and uh, last year there was around 24, 25,000 complaints to the Labour Ministry. So we can see that workers have more access. It doesn't mean that everybody's comfortable to approach the authorities, but for sure there is, is greater access. Um, we also uh, acknowledge that the labor courts, while they have, you know, the, the legislation is good, they are still dealing with a huge backlog in the cases that they're seeing. The courts didn't meet for seven months of 2020 due, due to the first wave of the, the COVID pandemic and the increase in complaints because many companies were, were were going uh, bust and workers were being left unpaid. So there is a backlog of, backlog of cases and for sure we, we fully agree and I think the government would, would fully agree that the time it takes for a worker uh, to recover their due wages is, is too long and there needs to be systems in place that make sure that um, workers' needs can be attended to in a, in a more uh, timely manner. Uh, there's another question for you, Max, but I would like to, to, uh, to, to, to there's a uh, question by Dickie Sparks and maybe everybody else can already thinking about the answer why uh, Max is answering uh, the follow up question. So the question from Wiki Sparks is, what is the one thing that the panel would like Western media to know about Qatar ahead of the World Cup that you feel is not represented by Western media? But why you all of you think about the answer? Um, uh, there's a follow-up question by uh, Mahfoud Amara, uh, a professor at Qatar University, uh, um, and he's asking, uh, uh, Max, despite all these labor reforms and improvement, however, we are still hearing criticism about the conditions of workers. Is it out of ignorance or lack, lack of effective communication, public relations from the side of ILO and the host? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, for sure, um the ILO and the government of Qatar, I think, could do more when it comes to communication. I think we've seen uh, improvement in the past few months on this. We now, now see from the Minister of Labor, Twitter feed, much more communication in terms of the number of labor inspections it's done, the number of complaints it's receiving, the number of workers who have changed jobs. I think that helps, that transparency helps to, to uh, show the world that these, these reforms are having the benefit or are uh, benefiting workers on the ground. But the reality is that still, if any journalist uh, comes to Qatar uh, any day of the week, they'll be able to find a worker who has uh, grievances, legitimate grievances, whether it's non-payment of wages or, or uh, accommodation standards that don't meet uh, 
national legislation. And that's always going to be the lead in a story. That that's, the, that's the human angle that's going to lead in any article. So it's only when we have the opportunity to have in-depth conversations like this one, we, we I think, help to, to change mindsets a little bit about the context, the nuance, the, the complexity of, of introducing labor reforms in a relatively short period of time. But I think after these conversations, I think uh, people sh change their minds somewhat and, and can acknowledge that the trajectory and the commitment is, is very positive. And there are no quick fixes. There's no instant solution to this. This is, this is a, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So for the question, what is the one thing you want the world to know about Kappa? I'm calling now the panelists in opposite order to the beginning. So first Aya, then Alexis, then Amal, and finally Gerd. Aya, 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 what's your take on the matter? Um, which question are we answering again? Is this uh, what's the one thing you want Western media to know about Kappa? One thing that I want Western media to know about cats are that we'll follow our own trajectory, whether there's a FIFA or not, to be honest, uh, when it comes to at least social dynamics, maybe when it comes to things about foreign foreign uh, uh, relations, when it comes to maybe uh, economics, that might be a bit of a different story. But when it comes to social development, I think that we'll follow our own trajectory. And I think that's a much safer road uh, to go down on because it's a sustainable one. And um, you know, international sporting events might uh, look good on the outside, but really what we should be concerned about is whether it feels good on the inside. Um, and I think there's some good work being done, uh, slow uptake, but I think there's some good work being done in regards to, um, uh, you know, first and foremost, labor issues. And I think women's rights, we're, we're slowly getting there. Um, and I think as well, a really important point is uh, child protection, really safeguarding children, really looking at youth issues from a holistic standpoint, um, you know, beyond uh, what these international events can do for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexis. I don't have anything specific. I think there is too much attention and I think for good reasons on labor rights. So um, women rights, you know, so I, I don't think it's fair to say whether well, they should spend less time discussing that and more time discussing, oh, this is a nice country, we have nice parks. Uh, but I think that it's not about the topic, but spending more time to get to know the country before they write an article. Because what I see is, and this is not the problem of those reporters or on the particular story, but the people write articles that get clicks. And I think that's the thing that has to change, not you know what they talk about. Find the substance and not what will get them clicks. Mm -hmm. um, Amal? Uh, I believe Qatar has been seen through uh, filters that uh, are distorted um, by misinformation, disinformation, propagandas, and and other things. Um, I think we, we, the, the Western world need to reconstruct, uh, and sorry for, for generalizing and calling it the Western world, but I think the, you know, the other parts of the world, uh, I think needs to uh, uh, reconstruct a, um, a, a human filter uh, through which they can uh, see Qatar, who, which is a very young nation with a very young ruler, and a young population, educated, intelligent, who are trying to negotiate their own identity and their place in the world. That's it, basically. Mm -hmm. Not to say that, of course, human rights are at the top of our agenda. Women's rights, definitely at the top of the agenda. Many things need to be done. Many, many things need to be done in terms of women's rights. But engaging with international treaties is only one factor, uh, you know, other um, uh, institutionalizing women rights, uh, uh, having uh, creating a, mon a monitoring entity, um, education. Um, so there are other factors that are important beyond 2022 uh, World Cup. Gerd? Well, it's a, it's a difficult choice, right? I mean, certain things you would want uh, to get out there, other things you'd want to change the picture completely. But I think that, that one of the key things really is what's been uh, suffusing our conversation so far, that's to say that this is a country that's not cardboard. This is not some caricature 
um, as represented by a lot of the media from, from outside. This is something that's living and breathing and thinking and developing from the inside. And that links to the point that many people made in this panel so far. A lot of the initiatives that we see uh, highlighted or accelerated in the context of this World Cup attention is that have actually got their roots in local society and in strategic thinking about future developments on, on the part of the leadership. That's why some of the things that are now happening, as I would argue, are not short term. These are long term things that have roots that, and they've got roots because they are they're linked to uh, local, genuine local thinking about these things and strategizing. And that's not that didn't start in 2010. So that's one of the key things. If I can just attach a footnote to that, one of these elements are examples of, as I say, that. that the representation of Qatar and Qataris as this kind of cardboard um, caricature is this thing about, oh, they have no football culture, right? You just need to come spend some time here, not just a couple of days, some time, and not just in the heart of the capital, but go around. And you, you know that that's not true, right? I mean, Pele came here, one of the biggest events back in the 19, I think it was the 1950s or 60s, was when Pele came to um, to play an exhibition match. The, the one big st stadium was totally full. It's like half the population was there. So you know, that's just one little example of one has to break through this caricature um, of, but, and it's 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 almost inevitable, right? I mean, people from the other side of the world, without very without much information about what goes on in places like Qatar will make up their own caricatures, especially if it's rooted in a long history of looking at these people from this part of the world as other, right? So we just have to break through that by exposure, but including not just telling nice PR stories, right? And that's, that's I like this particular webinar because we're, we're willing to be open, look at the warts, you know, all the, the, the negatives, the problems, and actually addressing them. That's what was clear in, in Max's uh, presentation. But actually, I've, I've been struck by the extent to which, certainly in a comparative sense in the, in the Gulf region and in the Middle East, the extent to which the authorities here have been willing to engage with the critics. I mean, compare the access that, well, this is the only ILO office anywhere in this region, uh, compare the access that Amnesty International has had. I mean, you know, so, that, that doesn't make all the problems go away, but it is actually worth noting that willingness to engage with criticism. And again, I, say, I think this is not just a question of painting a nice picture for the moment. This is something that's got much deeper roots. So Victor equally is writing that the World Cup has, as Alexis said, uh, put a uh, cutter on the map as a serious player in global international affair. And he's asking, what do you think will be the way forward for Qatar after 2022? I mean, uh, maybe if I can add, it's a question I often get from journalists, etc. cetera, uh, will the reform slow down after the World Cup? I think this is also a bit part of the question or, you know, will, will Qatar continue to, 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 to change uh, and, and reform? Um, I, I think that's a question maybe everybody would like to answer. Um, Max, would you like to start? And yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just just to say that um, you know, really to reiterate what Bird and, and Amal and others have said, uh, I fully agree that um, Qatar has been um, far more open uh, than many countries uh, in terms of the way it's engaging on this journey. Uh, and example is, is a couple of, well, in the last two months, we've received uh, trade union delegations from, from Asia, from Africa. There's a regional meeting of the Arab trade unions here also last month. So really um, access to uh, trade unions and civil society that, that is not common. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, that we really need to, to do more from the ILO side, maybe also from, from the Ministry of Labor side, is to better communicate how these reforms are not only good for workers, but also good for employers and good for the economy overall. Um, one of the arguments that we make is that you know, the, the kafala reforms 
create a pool of workers in the country that help, uh, that allow employers to hire without the risks and costs of international recruitment. Employers can find the workers that they need in the country uh, that match their needs more specifically. And that's, I think, an element of this uh, story that's not yet been properly told to, to many employers who are still uh, pushing back against these reforms. And more broadly, you know, by, by allowing this mobility within the country, instead of having this revolving door of workers coming in for a short period of time and then leaving with the skills and experience that they've gained in that time, you allow for circulation of skills in the economy. Uh, and you, in, in that way also you become uh, more attractive to, to uh, companies who are looking to invest in the region. So I think that's part of the, the, the sustainability angle uh, when it comes to these labor reforms, making sure that this argument is understood as not just being you know, pro worker, but really uh, in the interests of, of all parties. And that's very much in line with the national vision and I think understood by the leadership. Alexis, you already showed us your three-step model. So maybe based on that, what's your take on the question of what happens after 2022? Yeah, I, I, I think there are two parts. One is, if you abolish the kefala system, you will not bring it back just because the, the scrutiny is not on, on your side, right? So in that regards, I don't, I think the changes that are taking place and I think, you know, the ILO and the authorities for, you know, doing the work and of course there's more work to be done, but uh, I think those changes and I want to hope they are permanent. But in discussing other issues that my co-panelists brought up, of course, we will not see those discussions being accelerated. And you know, using the World Cup as a way to accelerate those discussions really works after the World Cup. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean I think those discussions will not take place. And the reason for that is, again, Qatar is trying to diversify. And you get global companies. And global companies are global citizens. And they have very high bar when it comes to how women get treated in the workforce, how uh, labor is getting treated. So by opening up to the world and getting those companies, you have to establish very high standards. So I think although the attention on the World Cup will be over, and it will not be quite be over because once you have the infrastructure you want to bid for other mega events, so you, you will always have those discussions. I think the ability to attract companies, but also do business with countries outside, let's say, you know, as you said in the beginning of the pre-panel session with Germany signing contracts, I think scrutiny will always be on the country and I hope those discussions will continue to take place. Mm -hmm. Am I? Uh, it's a very big question for. Um, I believe that women will play a bigger role in economy and politics. I think the discourse on gender equality uh, will normalize and will become a mainstream. Uh, I believe women voices will form a critical force that won't be reckoned with. Um, and uh, changes will happen. Changes need to happen and will happen because women are uh, more than half of the society and nothing could be achieved, no sustainable future, no sustainable economy, no sustainability to begin with if women were not active participants in, 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 in the culture uh, and equal citizens as well. Yeah, a majority of our students, we should tell the outside world, in Education City are women, and many of them are fantastic. Haya, would you like to add something? Sure. Um, my hope is for uh, moving forward that we as a nation, as a people, develop better future foresight mapping. Um, so winning a bid uh, 10 years ago uh, allowed us this kind of, um, you know, pathway, almost to see a pathway moving forward. And um, I think a lot of post-colonial societies and states really struggle with kind of imagining themselves in a future because they tend to be caught up a lot in past conditions and uh, present conditions and really struggle to kind of map a future for themselves with full autonomy and agency. I think in, in a more positive light, you know, uh, something like the FIFA World Cup will allow us to kind of think about what do, where do we want to see ourselves in 10 years time and have different actors actually come into play uh, 
to have these discussions, have uh, different kinds of audience members, you know, from the population, from the resident kind of population, um, come in and, and, and pitch in and be, um, you know, more forward thinking, you know, in, 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 um, in a more holistic way, hopefully a more organic way that's not necessarily tied to uh, just one event uh, that will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're muted. Is that me? I'm done. <laughs> I was just, I was just saying, yeah, not much to add. <laughs> but although, I mean, again, the, the main thing, I guess, think that, that that why I think these some of these things will continue to evolve. They will not simply fall flat altogether, is because they're partly rooted in ongoing dynamics in society here. And because they're rooted in a vision, a long-term vision about what this society and economy could be you know, on the part of the leadership. As, as Mark said, the Vision 2030 sketches out some of these things. Of course, you can always have beautiful documents. That's not, that's not the whole story, right? But it, I, the reason why I think that the impact of the World Cup is not going to be short-term is because the World Cup itself, as I said at the beginning, was part, was just one component of a much bigger strategy. Of future development and the the kind of view of how labor reforms for instance uh, can help business and economy that max was pointing to is is actually is actually a vision that's present among some that, that's a debate that's been had for many years among the top uh, of the the leadership here and of course there were disagreements about that some factions would th think would see this and others would not and amongst the broader commercial elite, many would not see that. But um, while ILO's presence and other factors might push this understanding a bit quicker, perhaps, that's a debate that's going to continue. But I, uh, to, to my mind, because of the things that uh, Alexis pointed to, this is going to break through, right? I mean, essentially, there's no way. But does it mean that it continues to go in that kind of, that, you know, uh, a rising straight line? No, probably not, right? It's going to have ups and downs and slow downs and, and, and speed up again over time. One doesn't switch a society around overnight, clearly. Um, but, but the key thing is, the, what gives me hope, it's part of a longer term vision and it's part of things that are happening locally, ground level. Yeah. Maybe the next question from Mahkoud Amara. Uh, Daniel, let me step in and make one comment on what yeah, Gertz has done. I, I think now that I think about it, one thing that changed with uh, winning the rights to, to host the World Cup is that, for, and, and Amal talked about it in higher, it's okay for people to raise these issues now. They learned that it's okay to raise those issues, and I don't think that will stop. But also the authorities learned that it's okay to talk about this issue because it, it benefits the country, it benefits society, it benefits the environment, the economy, and so on. And will it decelerate a little bit? Probably, but I think many other things will decelerate and hopefully the construction will work on the roads. But I think there's a structural change that it is okay in this country to talk about these things and it actually benefits the country. It's for the benefit of the country that we want women to have more rights, to have a more prominent role in society, in businesses, in how they bring up their children. And we already see the benefits to that. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe the question from Mahfoud Amara is for Ahaya and Amal. Um, do you think that the community in Qatar is fully involved with the FIFA World Cup? Amal, would you like to start? Uh, I do, uh, but also I, I, I do from my own perspective, from my own context, I see, for example, um, uh, how students in, in Education City K-12 are involved in uh, uh, sports commentary and having sports days. I think that the, the benefits of, of um, promoting a, a healthy, um, uh, living uh, through sports, um, uh, also sports that is open to both genders, um, the conversations that happen around uh, the event, um, the inclusivity, for example, um, uh, there's, there's lots of work on uh, how to make a, a World Cup um, inclusive and accessible uh, to all uh, profiles of people, uh, including the blind and the deaf, 
Um, so yes, from my perspective, from where I am right now, I see a huge involvement of everyone, kids and, and adults. Mm -hmm. Aya? I agree with Dr. Amor, but I'm going to take a different standpoint. I would say, uh, no, not everybody is involved in the World Cup. I think a lot of our discussions as well have been in very um, circles that have access to, to these conversations that happen in very privileged uh, spaces, you know, uh, where people have good access to education, good access to healthcare, good access to, you know, uh, sports, um, you know, sporting events that Dr. Dr. Amen was talking about. Um, it's fair to say that there are portions of the population that uh, wouldn't consider themselves stakeholders in these uh, in, in these discussions, there's stateless populations, there's a uh, labor, uh, labor population that is very much involved in, um, in building these stadiums in uh, kind of, you know, uh, staffing uh, the, these events, um, but, you know, will probably never have the ability to take a seat and attend a football match. And it's a sad reality um, because it takes it takes a whole country to actually make a sporting event like this happen. But um, it's also, I think, it's also important for us to say that not everybody can feel included by it. Um, yeah. yeah, I fortunately won in the lottery tickets for all the Germany matches. But I rather don't share what I had to transfer the money I had to transfer now because it's quite a lot, and certainly not everybody can afford that. Um, there is uh, Alexis another question uh, from uh, Mahmoud Amaro specifically addressed to you: uh, How the FIFA World Cup and sport events uh, in the country help Qatar in business terms and its transition to service knowledge economy? Uh, in acquiring competitive advantage in the region. Okay, thank you. I think I did address that to a big extent, so I will not repeat myself, but I said it's all about, you know, branding, getting attention on the country and the facilities makes it easier to attract business. And as everybody said, especially when you compete for talent, you compete for companies. So it, it you try to build an advantage. Now on a knowledge-based economy, Qatar Foundation, Qatar University, HBKU, this is what gives you a knowledge-based economy, not, not the World Cup, okay? But what the World Cup does, I think it's raise awareness about the work the state of Qatar has been doing to improve educational attainment. Again, through many institutions, many, many centers of excellence, improvements in the educational system. Of course, the tourists will not see that, but hopefully they will see Education City and the nice buildings, and they will visit the library, and then when they go home, they will start Googling it a little bit and they can find out that, uh, I would go back to what Amal said. This is a small country. They say when the, His Highness the Father Emir was born, you didn't have a single school. And we went from that to what we have now. We went, you know, a country of 300,000 people to have the World Cup, Al Jazeera, Qatar Airways, all this infrastructure. So I think it puts that in perspective. Mm -hmm. And I maybe, um... Add just a couple of lines. I think one of the things that has been accelerated, not initiated, but accelerated, is precisely infrastructure. And it, it's done, it, it's, it's been accelerated in such a way that's it's really quite extraordinary. Um, so the kinds of facilities, transport, metro, and so on and so on, the interconnectivity of the whole country uh, is that it's caught up with other places in the region and in some cases uh, past. You know, um, overtaken. So in that sense, the, that acceleration um, has, uh, I think, has some chance of giving Qatar um, at least a leg up, right, in, in that competition for, for investment and talent. Yeah, Dennis uh, McCormick is asking uh, an interesting question. He's asking what can Qatar do to enhance its reputation to those places not interested in football? It's a good question because I've discussed with my students a number of times the following question. Is football really the number one sport in Qatar or isn't it cricket if we look at the composition of the population? So what can Qatar do to enhance its reputation to those places not interest in football? I think this is an international relations question, Gerd. You're muted. Professor Monoman. 
I, I see. I seem not to like the sound of my <laughs> voice. Um, that's a very that's a difficult one. But it's, it goes back to what what Alexis was saying, and I was alluding to at the beginning, right? That you make yourself visible by any means, and we've talked about LNG, which is of course centrally an economic uh, strategy, but it also means and now and now it's got a, it, it became visible. And with places like Korea, China, Japan, delivering hugely important portions of their energy needs on a reliable kind of way. Now, of course, we see that Qatar is in the limelight because of the Ukraine crisis. The whole and all of Europe needs extra gas. And where is it going to come from? Well, Qatar is clearly in the future one of the potential sources. So that kind of visibility is one component. Mega events successful delivery of mega events like the Asian uh, Games before and now the World Cup and a number of other uh, uh, events, whether in sports or other areas, is another way. Um, engagement in, so we, we haven't really talked about Qatar's diplomacy yet. You know, Qatar has had a, a very particular style of diplomacy or, or, or ambition to be, to have links with as many people as possible, many countries as possible. Um, without, if at all possible, without burning bridges with anyone. And that, on the one hand, reduces the risk, I guess, but on the other hand, it turned Qatar consciously into a very useful interlocutor for lots of other players. So the Americans called on Qatar ultimately to, to facilitate relations or negotiations with the Taliban, um, with the whole change in the situation in Afghanistan and then the evacuation efforts. Qatar was absolutely central, even in the negotiations uh, over the JCPOA between US, Russia, Iran, and so on. Again, Qatar plays some role. So that kind of is, that's another way of, of making yourself visible in a non-threatening way that shows you're useful to lots of, lots of parties without necessarily having your own agenda. Um, so I think that's what Qatar has been doing. This is all part of a much bigger security strategy that's been pursued really since uh, the early 90s and particularly actively since uh, Sheikh Hamad became uh, Amir. Max, I think uh, you could also comment on this because when I look at the countries where most workers are coming from, uh, India, um, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, um, I mean, um, what is Qatar doing, uh, I mean, in, in your realm of, of workers' rights? I mean, it, it affects so many issues of recruitment of these workers, etc. I think uh, a lot has changed uh, in, in these areas uh, over the last years. Yeah, I think, um, I think Qatar uh, and, and some of the work it's done is, is helping it to become the, the destination of choice. Uh, in many of these migration corridors. Uh, and I think um, it's, it's not quite there yet because you know, to make migration safe and fair and, and productive, you know, it requires efforts at both sides of, of, of the migration corridor. Uh, but for sure, I would say there is a, a level of recognition by the countries of origin of the, the efforts that, have, that are underway. And you can see this from the not only the government delegations that are coming to Qatar, but also from the civil society and trade union delegations, that this is a space in which they can cooperate to, to improve uh, working conditions. So I think uh, the perception uh, is, is also evolving and changing in, in many countries. But uh, again, this is not something that, that can be fixed overnight. The issue of recruitment costs is something that's still deeply ingrained. Uh, the vast majority of workers are still paying recruitment costs to come to, come to, to Qatar. It needs to be regulated on both sides of, of, of the corridor um, and, and making sure that, you know, first and foremost, the issue of wages and the untimely payment of wages is, is the reason why people come here. And, uh, you know, it's on that basis that, you know, the, the, the success of the migration experience will be judged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, um, I dream that Qatar would be a, a cultural hub, um, uh, a place where you would see and live uh, multiculturalism, where it has uh, 
combine the new and the old, where people can come and experience tradition and modernity, where a third culture, a hybrid culture, has been uh, created to uh, welcome everyone, to say the truth. Because yeah, Qatar, because of its uh, geographical um, uh, um, placement too has always been multicultural and has always been a place where uh, people from different ethnicities and different religions and different sectors have either passed through or lived in. Um, and I believe with, with the population in Qatar that I don't think would be fixed anytime soon. Uh, and rather than fixing, it and perceiving it as a problem, I think, needs to be perceived in a different way. Um, how do we embrace this diversity? How do those sub communities come together and uh, and form a homogeneous, um, 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 you know, social fabric for everyone to thrive in? We kind of got a, a glimpses of that at the beginning of the blockade when we were speaking about the social cohesion and how everyone came together to stand beside Qatar, the non-Qataris, before the Qataris. Um, unfortunately, this discourse you know, got a bit problematized during the Shura Council elections with the whole conversation about who's you know, an indigenous and who is true Qatari and who's not true Qatari. So I think, I believe that we have the capacity to be world leaders when it comes to social justice, creating a multicultural society that is grounded in social justice and human rights and women's rights. This is what I dream of as a Qatari woman, to say the truth. And this is what I believe we are capable of reaching. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Camilla Swart Arias from Hamid Khalifa University is asking, do you think that those who may not feel as included in the World Cup still feel positive about the country's hosting of this mega event? And what suggestions do you have for more engagement? Um, yeah, Max, I mean, you have a lot of conversations with workers, etc. So what's your take on the matter? Do they take pride in working in a country that's hosting the World Cup? Yes, I, I, I fully believe so. I think uh, um, everybody is excited <laughs> about the World Cup and, and uh, what's coming next. But, um, and it depends on your situation, of course. But for uh, most low wage workers, it's certainly not the priority. The priority is, is sending money home to your family. To give you some context, you know. Uh, in some of the studies we've done around the minimum wage, <clears throat> you can see that you know, low wage workers are sending around 80% of their income back home to their families. So it's frankly, it's, it's, they're not spending much money here. They are looking at maximizing their income, uh, even maximizing their working hours in order to earn enough to send back, uh, back home. But of course there should be opportunities for for workers to have recreational activities, to be able to enjoy the, 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 the sporting facilities and other you know, parks and everything else that, that uh, everybody else is able to enjoy, especially with you know, ensuring the, the right to a day off for all workers, including domestic workers, I think it's essential. Um, but yeah, while they're excited about it, I really don't feel for most it's, it's forefront in their mind. I remember when going to a match at the FIFA Arab Cup in one of the stadiums, uh, I think it was an Al Bayt stadium, there were written all the names of the workers who, who built the stadium. Uh, that's something I, I really like. And uh, I would like to also um, uh, refer to one blog we had from Professor Susan Dunn from Northwestern University. She wrote a blog on uh, titled Qatar's Golden Opportunity to Create Football Fandoms for, for Migrant Workers. Um, maybe you want to have a look at that. And I mean, it, it's not just about going to the stadiums, right? It's also about like providing other opportunities to matches like on big screens throughout the city and, and things like that, which I assume um, will be done at the, at the World Cup. Um, so, um, Can, can I maybe just uh, interject something there? I remember well the um, the the, uh, the Arab Cup, right? The Arab Cup when that, that was um, uh, played across the region, where Qatar eventually won 
And the, the sense of excitement that was in, across, across uh, Qatar and across Doha was just like with the instance in the blockade that uh, Dr. Amal referred to. It was extraordinary. I mean, you had in the places outside in the big, there were fan zones, but there were also public spaces with huge screens. Everybody, Qataris, Westerners, work, workers, people from, from, from South Asia, everybody was sitting out there and, and cheering for, for, for Qatar. That was quite an extraordinary thing to witness, uh, actually. Um, of course, it, that ebbs and flows, right? But it does, it does tell you something that, I mean, football perhaps in some ways, or these big international events can create, not, I wouldn't say homoge homogeneity, and probably homogeneity is not a good thing anyway, but certainly more coherence, right, and interaction. Um, some of the biggest flag wavers for Qatar afterwards were, were migrants, you know, people certainly non-Qataris. Non but that reminds me of a study that's been done uh, recently by a colleague of, my, of, of mine, of ours here at Georgetown, and uh, one of our students, a Qatari students, precisely about the differential experience of, uh, or the, diff the experience of football in Qatar. Again, counter the narrative that Qatar doesn't have a football history, they found that, that it's very, uh, there is a very clear um, association of Qataris with particular football teams, but very often they don't go to the big stadia to watch them. They watch them all on, on big TV screens in their majlises, right? Where people gather, the men gather, and they, so it's a family thing, and very much extended family thing, and among women too. So it's just the experience of how football is, is, is um, how, how they are fans, that's different. But that's for those local clubs that are associated with particular neighborhoods and particular families and clans, what might be happening with something like the World Cup and before the Arab Cup is that you break those um, silos, right? And this is where then they might go out and they do go out. People of all nationalities, including Qataris, do then go out to these big stadia. So I think that that would be an interesting thing to follow, how these bigger games, these international games, um, change if they do at all, the way in which fans from different nationalities, including Qataris, relate to each other. Yeah, I believe we have uh, answered all questions. I mean, sport will certainly remain uh, a main uh, a policy tool for Qatar in 2030. There will be the Asian Games in the country, Qatar's bidding for the 2027 AFC Asian Cup. So, but let me ask you in very general terms, uh, a last question to everybody. What do you wish for Qatar for the future? And I will call this panelists in opposite order to the beginning. Uh, Max, if you could uh, start, what do you wish for Qatar for the future? I, I wish that, um, that these reforms are really appreciated by, I'm speaking about the labor reforms, are really appreciated by, by all parties and that the, the, the mutual benefits of it are seen by workers, uh, by employers, by the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. Haya? Yeah, I'll build on what Max said. I think uh, my hope is for different kinds of reforms. So social reforms, political reforms, you know, uh, to reach a wider audience um, in Qatar and for it to kind of is simulate, you know, more cohesion or, um, you know, more togetherness, <laughs> what uh, Professor Gerd was saying, you know, for that moment to not just be in moments of, um, you know, joy at the end of a football match, but for it to be at something that, you know, we've collectively reached as a result of like, um, you know, hard work, collective action and, and just pure reform. Mm -hmm. Alexis? Yeah, I think it would be nice for the world to get to know Qatar. Like we live here, we know the country, it's so safe, it's so nice. We see problems as well, we see areas for improvement. It would be nice if the World Cup is an opportunity for more companies and people to really get to know Qatar, to know the culture, but you know, to, to have those discussions, not to be a one one time thing. Mm -hmm. Amal? Uh, I wish for Qatar to institutionalize women rights and um... Uh, where uh, that that would be maintained uh, afterwards by um, civil society that doesn't exist right now in Qatar, 
um, I wish for men and women to be equal citizens. And I think it's only then that we would speak about, as I said, sustainability in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this time I unmuted myself without prompt, I hope. Um, I, I can just reflect what everybody else has said, really. It's, it's this thing about bedding down and, and further evolving all the changes that are already happening, you know, without losing what's here, but kind of um, an, 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 what's the word? Um, not, I don't mean indigenous, a authentic, an authentic uh, continuation of some of these trends driven by a conversation between Qataris and non-Qataris and Qataris of all stripes and non-Qataris of all stripes. Um, I, I, we know that this, these things go slow and it, perhaps it's, it's, it's a good thing that they go slow. You can't simply decree these things overnight. Um, but I, I, I hope that the evolution that we've been seeing with fits and starts continues and I have hopes that it will with fits and starts, but I, I'm, I hope it will. And that it's a generational thing, um, but uh, I'm, on, I'm certainly on the optimistic side. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Many thanks to our panelists and all participants. We greatly appreciate your remarkable contributions and questions. We will be posting the recording of this panel discussion soon on our website and on YouTube. So be on the lookout for that. Also check out our website for previous lectures, blog posts, and our podcast series. Contact us if you would like to get involved, for example, by contributing to the blog. Finally, follow CS and GOQ on social media to get updates about upcoming events and other activities. We hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy. Take care.